you've got credits at the end, title sequences at the end of films, which, you know, I feel like, you know, you've just sat through a conversation with this story at the end of a conversation. You just go, all right, bye. <laughs> and then you leave. Wait, you we're know? not meant to do that. Yeah. <laughs> you can imagine being in a cinema and then suddenly the lights, you know, just cuts off, lights on. All right, bye. It's it's yeah. not like that. And so title sequences and credits for me is a kind of a way of films and stories that you've kind of been invested in, investing your time with as a way of saying, you know, this is the end of the conversation. It allows you to process it. That's amazing. Welcome to Filmmaking Frame, the show that interviews industry professionals to find out the tips and tricks to make it behind the silver screen. With me, as always, is my co-host, Tom Dexter, and myself, Daniel Hughes. Today with us is award-winning graphics, motion graphics and title designer, Santi Boddington. Santi started her career working on the graphics for trailers such as Peterloo and Jojo Rabbit, and then went on to design the title sequences for Netflix's Inventing Anna. She now works as a freelancer. Hello, Santi. Hello. Thank you for having me. So we always like to start this podcast by asking our guests to tell us a bit about what is your role and how does it fit into the general film industry ecosystem? Um, so I would say my role falls into post-production, um, sometimes more graphics than VFX. Um, and what I mean by that is the graphics and the motion graphics that I do in post-production can work with VFX. So if you've got a phone, for example, any of the graphics that you see appearing on that phone, animating, or even text messages that appear next to the person, that's what I would design and animate. If it appears on the phone, I would design and animate that and then supply that element to VFX that then applies it or Comp composites onto the phone to make it look realistic and it makes it feel at one in the, the place that it's supposed to be. Awesome. So, so there's a beautiful shot that was done in camera, then there's a beautiful bit of graphics and it merges it together so it's one shot and it looks seamless. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Exactly. So you can have like reflections on it that VFX would apply, um, blurring, just anything that would create a more realistic look. Um, so that's one side of the things I do. And then the other part is I do title sequences, uh, end credits, opening credits, rollers that you get at the end of films. Um, I design and animate a lot of that as well. Yeah. I think uh, since Game of Thrones, and probably mm. before the, the Wire and various ones, it became a big thing to have title sequences on the front end. Uh, this is probably a question I should have saved for, for later in the podcast, but mm -hmm. what is what is the proportion of, of projects out there that are having big title sequences versus sort of simpler? I think the TV realm certainly recently has had a big focus on title sequences. You know, you've got Netflix's Stranger Things, um, Game of Thrones, which is a good reference. Um, those are like big budgeted title sequences. But then you can get smaller title sequences that are just as effective, like Breaking Bad. You know, that was a very short, simplistic, but beautifully done. And that you get everything that you needed to know from it from like 10 seconds. Yeah, that was really efficiently done. Yeah. And I know from when we've spoken in the past that. You, you told me that Stranger Things even uses their title screens in the marketing. Yes, yeah. So that's what's the beauty of the, the work that you can do as a title designer is that you can see it transform from the screen into everyday, you know, relation to the film or TV show. Um, Game of Thrones, for example, is one of them as well. But Stranger Things, you know, you see it, not just on like t-shirts and marketing and it's just like the show's brand logo, but then you can get what's 
really fascinating about Stranger Things as well is that you get all the pop culture references. So you get a lot of people making the Stranger Things look, but with like different text um, or different words and things, which is the same for um, Mad Men as well. All the Simpsons as well. Like you see that is like pop culture and it becomes more than just the title sequence logo that you see on screen, but it can come out and into everything else. The, the, sorry, does the design for that originate with the title designer or can it come from various places? Like, is that, if you were a title designer, you can say, like, I, I designed that, that's that look as well mm-hmm. as the actual animation. Yes. Yeah. I mean, like, um, you've got um, Star Wars, for example that was designed and animated by a title designer. And then that's become the show's, the franchise's logo yeah. from the beginning. That's a and the, example. And the iconic scroll as well that you get, you know, in a galaxy far, far away, you know, that endless scroll. And apparently um, they did it on a whim and they hated it and they thought it was going to be terrible and they didn't expect it to have the reaction that it did and that it became the staple of the f- whole franchise is just that piece of design. You must wish you were in the rooms of some of these designers when they created those <laughs> iconic <laughs> designs. I think it would be fascinating, especially Soul Bass, which was an iconic um, title designer of his time. Um, and he worked on things like Hitchcock and... Yeah, H- exactly. Um, and then still to this day, you get a lot of references to his motion design work that you see in like Catch Me If You Can. The title sequences that they did for Catch Me If You Can, you can see it's like a direct reference. But even Taylor Swift's um, music video or like lyric video that she did um, was almost a direct reference to his work as well. Wow. Wow. I think it was for Look What You Made Me Do, um, one of the music, like, lyrical video that she she released a couple of years ago. Um, because as somebody who recognizes that style, I was like, oh, that's definitely, like, inspired by Soul Bass. Yeah. Um, but I just thought it was fascinating that it was, like, in the music world, especially for, like, Taylor Swift. Yeah. Who's grossed so much money with her wrist table. It's amazing. Carla, you kept looking at me. I know, but uh, I, 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 I was looking at you to be like amused of like I feel like neither of us are oh, Swifties. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> although I do actually really like her music. I just yeah. I don't follow it, so I can't name things. Mm-hmm. Um, amazing. So, so we also it'd be really fascinating to know at what point in your early years or into your teens, your early twenties, whatever it is, that you decided you wanted to be a title designer or, or was it just design what was the what was your route what i think in terms of title design it was when i was in the cinema and i can't remember what age i was but we had gone to the cinema to see a series of unfortunate events by lemony snicket um and the original one the original the not the netflix yeah. <laughs> So this was going to the cinema to see that and they had an end title sequence and I was just in complete awe by this title sequence and it left such an impression on me that I remember leaving that cinema and thinking that was somebody's job was to make that. I want to do that. I want to make that. Um, So since then it kind of became my vocation to be able to go out and pursue that um and I had an artistic background you know I did fine art at school and I did a little bit of stop motion animation so I was interested in animation um but I didn't really know how to get into the film industry I wasn't exposed to any of that growing up none of my family are in the industry no one in my immediate family were in the creative industry like that in any way Um, so when I was looking at courses at universities, I didn't really know what I was looking for. I just knew I wanted to do something with art. Um, 
And I came across a course in Glasgow, um, which was for communication design. Um, and this open day that I went to, because I went to lots of different Scottish universities on open days, um, they advertised this course, which really appealed to me. And I thought that's, you know, that's pretty much what I want to be doing. Um, because it, it focuses on like broad aspect, does illustration, design, um, branding, typography, animation, like loads of different aspects of design. Um, so I thought that's what I want to do. Went and did the course, got accepted into Aberdeen. Um, and one of the projects that we were tasked to do was, I think in my second year or third year, was to create a title sequence animated based on a book that had been made into a TV series or a film yet. And so I had found this really good website at the time, which is still a really good resource now, called Art of the Title. So it's got a huge library of amazing title sequences and studios that create title sequences as credits. Um, and I used that as a reference to create my own first ever title sequence. And I knew from before at the cinema that that's what I wanted to do. So I was able to then use that project as like a way to pursue that. Um, so once I graduated from university with a first, I was then st stuck again, not knowing how to get into the industry. You know, I've got a degree in design and animation, um, but no kind of idea of how to actually get into that part of design. And um, I did an animation course and it was while I was th in this animation course that a friend of mine, she wanted to do documentary and filmmaking and camera work, um, Lizzie Owen, who you should have on this podcast as well <laughs> as a future guest. We'll invite her, yeah. Yeah. And um, she sent me, she forwarded me from the National Film and Television School a new course that they were starting that year um, focusing on motion graphics in the film and TV industry. So doing title sequences, doing graphic design on, you know, in film. Um, and she was like, this has got your name on it. Like almost, all over. Yeah, it. it sounds like they almost designed the course for, for me. You. Yes, <laughs> it really was. And um, and I remember getting it. And I was just thinking, oh my god, this is it! Like I have to do this. Um, and it was a diploma course. It was one year, and I had already graduated, so I finished my three months animation course that I was doing, um, which was actually in Canada. So I remember flying from Canada to London uh, to Aberdeen where I lived at the time getting on a plane the next day jet lagged to fly from Aberdeen to London London to Beaconsfield on a bus mm -hmm. and then had my interview and they essentially offered me a place at the end of the interview and they just said um Hugo who's the course the head of the course it's just such a good tutor. He was amazing. And he said, um, well, you know, it's you've got a place if you want it. You know, he was happy with my portfolio and, you know, um what you know, what I was interested in and everything. So <laughs> I just remember messaging my parents um on the way back to Heathrow to then get the plane back to Aberdeen, just saying all right, so like a couple of weeks, I'm, I'm moving to London and wow. to Beaconsfield. Um, so I was really excited, but oh, I think I was so lucky because the jet lag, basically, I was wide awake for the few hours that that interview was. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then you crashed. And then I crashed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that's how I got from being a student to going to university to having this course offered by the NFTS. And I know now that there are a couple of other courses that I think do similar things um, at other universities. 
Um, but I don't think any offer it quite like the film school. And what I really, really valued the most about the film school was that you work directly with other students, working with them side by side. So you could be working with documentary, you could be working with TV, you could be working with the game students on their projects. And, you know, they're working with other students like composers or um, sound or um, editors that are all students learning and practically doing everything all practical. Um, and I think that's what I took away the most from that course. You're, you're designing for actual films yes. rather than the theoretical adaptation of a book. Correct. Correct. So, which whereby you wouldn't have competing voices on the design and all of the human elements of collaborating when you're working in film. Exactly. I think it was like the first exposure to real world working um, projects that I got. And because you were, you know, sheltered in a way through, you know, your course heads and everything, uh, you, you get to make mistakes as well. So you can learn from that. And I think that was very, very valuable. Yeah, so exciting. I wish I could do design and then go, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jess and do design now. And so what was your first job coming out of the NFTS? Um, so what the NFTS does a lot of, um, like I did the same when I had my degree show at university, but the NFTS did something similar where they have like a exhibition slash um, showcase where they show the students' work and they invite industry professionals along or like friends of the, f the school or um, people that would be involved in that area. Um, so from that, I met... Um, Harry, who worked at the time at uh, a company called Empire Design that does trailers. And we got chatting and swapped contact details. And then a few days later, he emailed me and they said that they were looking for somebody to fill a junior position. And they wanted to invite me in for an interview um, because he had seen my work and he was really impressed. Um, and, you know, I went up to him and I talked to him as well. Um, so they invited me in. I showed them my portfolio and it became very apparent that they were more about talking about themselves as a company than it was them asking me questions. But because that, That's good because that means they're selling themselves to yeah. you so they can convince you to work there. Yeah, um, yeah. and I'd never had any interviews before that, like professional interviews, um, other than like maybe one trial shift at like Boots or something <laughs> <laughs> when I was a student. <laughs> did you get that job? I did, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they, they offered me a two-week trial period, um, which I completed successfully, and then they moved me on to a full-time position, um, which, you know, obviously had the three month probation and everything, which I passed with flying colors. Um, and so I was, that was my first full time job out of university. Um, and I think from the time I graduated to, um, getting a full time job, I was very fortunate that, you know, I managed to do that within like a couple of weeks after graduating. So I was very, very lucky. So you'd gone on this journey and now here you were an actual paid designer. Yeah. Amazing. And I still don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I, I have a surprisingly quick, common in our industry. Yeah. <laughs> I have a quick question before we sort of delve into some of your professional career. Uh-huh. What what would you say to past Xanthi now with your experience? when she was either looking to go to NFTS or first going into Empire? Um, I think going into the NFTS, um, I feel like I did a lot of the 
the right things, which was, you know, saying yes to everything, um, taking on as many projects as I could, you know, really milking as the experience while I was there as much as possible. Um, but then it did stretch me too much. And I think that was the issue was that I was always saying yes. You know, can you can you help us with this? Yes, of course. Can you, you know, get this by tomorrow? Yes, you know, I'll do it. Whereas I think that is a there's a very good learning experience by doing that. And my skills definitely um took off and you know multiplied um in a very fast way. But near the end of it I was probably close to burning out because not only was I doing the course projects that they were assigning us but also all the ex like outside projects that I was taking on as like personal projects for like the video game courses and um you know some of the documentary um or like even other extra little projects that I was helping friends out or like other um directors with their like you know, short. Um, so I think looking back, I would say it is okay to say no, or at least have like, um, realistic expectations because you go in there thinking that you, know, you can just, you can take on everything. Um, so uh, yeah. And if I may add feeling like you have to take on everything. Yes. To make yeah. the most. Well, that and that when you're still in the building stage of your career, that if you turn down any opportunity, someone will work. Well, they wouldn't never, they'd never offer me one again. Or like, uh, I'm only speaking from my own experience and also from people I've chatted, but seeing if that mm. chimes with you. Yeah. I think it's very, very common when you're starting out, when, you, when you, you're so passionate about getting into the film and TV industry to just take every opportunity. I, I would say counterpoint to what you're saying is in a way you learnt at the best time. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the benefits of going into education is, and I know I had this when I was at the National Film Tourism School, was you do take on more than you can necessarily do, but at least you've learnt that in a setting where you're all students. Yes. So yeah. if, you, if you were in the industry and you said yes to lots of projects, as a freelancer especially, and then you can't deliver on them. That's person one, person two, person three aren't going to hire you again. Yeah. They might tell person four, five, and six not to hire you. And so then you're desperately trying to get the person seven to... <laughs> and, yeah. and there's a knock-on effect to it. Whereas, and it, I mean, to be honest, it sounds like you actually delivered on the projects even though you were burnt out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at the, at the in, you know, when you're in education. But it's worth learning those lessons. And yeah. so I'd say to, to someone listening to this, if you're in education and do take on the projects and calibrate. Just yeah. be aware that you are doing that. I suppose that's the thing that yeah. you're kind of trying to convey. Exactly. Is that you don't necessarily realize that you're calibrating how much you can take on. Yeah. So if you are aware of that, take on as much as you can, but be conscious that you are calibrating what you can deliver at uh, any one time. I think, that's, I think that's a great shout. And use it as when you go past your limits, there's a benefit there because now you know where that limit is. Whereas Correct. if you were, if you just were like, well, I don't want to push myself too much. If I don't want to push myself, it's like you almost have to go too far in order to be able to adjust. Mm -hmm. uh, so a question then on that: What would you say? So what what does feeling burnt out feel like? How do you recover from that? You know, if you were to 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 find another designer looking a little bit stressed and mm -hmm. overworked, what what's your experience of that, and what can you sort of pass on? I think what really helped a lot was Hugo, my head, of course, um, when, you know, I was becoming more and more visibly stressed with the amount of work that I was doing and trying to get everything delivered on time. And he said, um, you know, just, just remember, we're designers, we're not surgeons. No one's going to die, you know, so don't feel so stressed and I always remember that because when you know things that you know work later on in the years um 
things would get really stressful. You know, you've got like demands and deadlines coming and everything. It always helps just thinking that and just being like, no one's going to (laughs) die if this doesn't render in the next hour. You know, they can wait, you know, another 30 minutes. Yeah. It's not going to kill them. <laughs> so I think to answer that was something that really helps me stay centered in just knowing that what you're doing isn't as critical as, you know, doing open heart surgery. Then what you feel, yeah. Yeah, and that I was working myself up too much because of that. Um, but I think certainly feeling burnt out, um, you do start to recognize the, the signs. Um, Sometimes too late, unfortunately, with a lot of creative people. Um, They push themselves to the point where you you realize that you've gone too far and then you have to kind of take a break. And then the recovery time is is longer because you've gone past that point. And I'm going to butcher a great metaphor for this that I heard. I was like, that nailed it. It was... I'm sure we've all heard the story of the golden goose and mm-hmm. it laying the eggs. Yeah. And, you know, the farmer has a golden goose, it lays golden eggs, and one day he's like, I'm t- like this is great, but I'm tired of waiting for these eggs to be laid. I'm just going to cut open the goose and I'm going to get all the eggs at once. And he, he does that and there are no eggs inside. And so now he has no eggs and no goose. And the way I it don't was, remember that part of the story. <laughs> do you not? It, it, that, that's the, uh, where he, he, um, that's the lesson he makes. Where does he does not understand... Uh, Goose yeah. anatomy there. Yeah. Um, doesn't understand golden goose anatomy. Yeah. Um, and I saw someone describe it as like, when working as a creative professional, it's like, you are the golden goose. And you can push yourself and push yourself and push yourself to try and produce more and do more impressive stuff, mm. which is, but if you do that and then you break yourself, then there will be no more golden eggs. Yes. And so there's a tendency to be like, well, I can't exercise today or I've got to not get good sleep. And then it's gone. And it's like, if you do that too much, in the aim of, and I, I was going for walking back part of the pharmacy, I was like, if you give everything to the job, you end up failing to give everything to the job mm-hmm. because you can't sustain that and then neither you nor the job has what it needs. Yeah. It's amazing because I do, I feel like I've only just realized that lesson in the recent years. Like it takes having worked in the industry for a while and then finding your breaking point to go, oh, as a human being, I have a breaking point. <laughs> yeah. Because you don't, you just go work, 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 passion, 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 passion. Um, I, I'm wondering to myself, what do surgeons and paramedics say to themselves <laughs> when it gets stressful? Because I, I, we hear it uh, from other guests and, and people we talk to in the industry, mm. the, the, it's not life or death. Yeah. yeah. So what happens when it is life or death? I don't know. I think no. you'd have you... to have a different podcast <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for that. <laughs> well, basing this entirely on medical dramas I've yeah. watched. <laughs> Great that to be. Yeah. yeah, exactly. They uh, they hook up a lot in the on-call room. <laughs> um, they drink, it, yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, they drink lots of coffee and uh, they're all ridiculously good looking. So, mm. that. Great. <laughs> Great. Yeah, so you've made it into the industry. Mm-hmm. Working at a trailer place, you've yep. designed, as I said in the opening, uh, graphics for things like Peter Lou and Jojo Rabbit and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, how long were you there? What was your thinking about what you wanted to achieve either while you're there or beyond that? What's the what's next steps for Santi? Um, so I was with Empire Design for two years and um, I have a kind of way of looking at work which I believe my, my father... Um, taught me which is after two years of being in a position or a job you reflect you are either have you learned everything you can't have learned from where you are now if the answer is no stay there for another two years if the answer is yes you feel like you have learned everything that you feel like you can learn do you have room to move up or if not, move on. Um, and going into the industry, I always wanted to do title sequences. So the work that I was doing for Empire was more marketing. So a lot of this, the films were already made. 
they already had like their identity um and this was more of like the marketing side of things rather than production and post production and it was a really good job i learned loads and it allowed me to have time after work to take on smaller projects so like doing short films or animating and designing in my spare time working with designers and directors that i wanted to be doing and i did my first feature film um perfect 10 which was um screened in the um london film festival 2019 um and that was my first feature film that i had a credit on um and it was equally as amazing because it was in the london film festival so it was incredible um so i knew that's what i wanted to do um so after 2 years of being at empire i reflected and i thought no now's a good time for me to leave because i want to be pursuing more production post production type work um so i handed in my notice in the beginning of march 2020 <laughs> <laughs> to pursue um work in the film industry and I had a lot of connections. I'd reached out to a lot of people. Um, so there was a lot of work heading my way. Um, so I started working with a studio that um, mainly focused on documentaries, but they did graphics for documentaries, title sequences. So it was a lot more in the direction that I wanted to be going in. Um, but unfortunately, because of the pandemic, um, you know, I worked with them in the studio for a week and then they sent us all home so i had to work remotely with them um for like the three months that i was working with them um and then everything pretty much shut down like the entire film industry shut down um there was one project that i worked on with them um which was for netflix and i think i mentioned this earlier it was a really interesting documentary because it was all found footage because they couldn't do any filming of or interviews or anything, um, which was American family um, murder next door. Um, about Sharon Watts. Um, so I would say that documentary had like a very big emphasis on graphics. Yeah. So it was a huge project to deliver during lockdown remotely what's it like working on a film like that presumably you're working with material that isn't overly pleasant um i think it's it's very interesting because from people that i've spoken to that have worked in that kind of work um you either become completely detached or you become really involved and it is very difficult um especially as a young woman watching live videos or youtube um facebook videos that this woman had posted about her family and how much she loves her husband who uh, you know spoilers um kills her um and there was a moment when you were going through all this material which you kind of have to um, kind of treat in a way that's not like um, over centralized, but you want it to feel real and you want it to, to help tell the story as well. <clears throat> so there was times where I would be, you know, you know, going through all this and I would be work, 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 work. And then I would stop and then you would like hear what she says. And then I'd think, oh my God, like this is, this is actually her. This was her, her life online pretty much. Um, and it's, it's kind of hard not to kind of. To take that. To, yeah. So I think I probably took it, it the more emotional way rather than the detached, like, oh, it's just a job, you know, mm -hmm. which I think some people might find that probably healthier or easier to do um but it was a dark and i think also because of the pandemic as well mentally it's, it was a very dark kind of time to be in as well it's something i've never really considered i guess i haven't had the, the 
pleasure of working in documentary at all, regardless of what the topic is. Mm. And I've never really thought about it. I don't know about you, Daniel, where we, we do everything we do is fiction. So even even when there are deaths or murders or, you know, I, I watched a show called Gangs of London and there were a load of chopped up cows and human bodies and stuff but i knew it was all fake so i didn't mm. i was just like cool this is interesting it's a bit different from what i usually see and then move on so that's really interesting we'll have to get a documentary yeah. director uh, in at some point yeah i think we should because i've worked on the gold which was a dramatic reenactment of the bricks mats robberies and in that one of the um, villains rather brutally kills a policeman but he managed to get off the murder trial in real life um, rather unpleasant character he ended up stabbing someone to death on the M25 hard shoulder because of road rage um, but that was actors playing real events mm. so I was able to separate it in the same thing as if it was just a script that had though I will say there was one I worked on uh, The Sun which was by the director who had just won the Oscar for The Father with Anthony Hopkins and spoilers so Cut away for the next 30 seconds if you want to watch the film. But the kid ends up taking his own life. And the, reading the script really affected me. when Because there's a bit where his dad imagines an older version of him and you don't realise that he has actually killed himself. Mm. And that was a lot of members of my team really struggled with that. And the production did a great thing where they offered free therapy that you could redeem at any time. Mm-hmm for every single member of the crew and they made it very clear like you can step off set and that's amazing that they did that yeah, it, yeah. And, it, and lots of people took them off on anyway and it was it was hard on people I feel like from what I've been reading recently is that film industry productions are taking that more seriously now they are and the amount of sleep people get and well mm-hmm. welfare generally has improved a lot since I started you know eight years ago mm-hmm. yeah. the so after that rather harrowing <laughs> <laughs> oh I'll I will mention mm. um so I worked on that documentary and then um obviously after the you know the film industry kind of shut down for a little bit um, I then started freelancing full time and began working for a studio, um, called Momoko, and that was th- through freelancing, and that's where I got to design and animate the title sequence for Netflix's Inventing Anna, um, which was an incredible project, um, and then after that I got a full time job with Lip Sync Post. Um, where I've recently left to go back to freelance um, again after the two year mark mm. um, and basically I would mention because of the other documentary that um, another documentary that I worked on very closely with um, the director um, Helena Cohen she directed um this very moving documentary about um, Grace Mullane, the British backpacker who was killed by her Tinder date in New Zealand. And what was quite fascinating about this documentary was the police were able to catch her killer through her social media. And, you know, we had to work with a lot of material that was her you know, her tweets, her personal blogs, her text messages, you know, to her friends and family, as well as her Instagram stories and posts um, leading up to her death. So it was very kind of interesting from a design perspective of how do you communicate this online social world on screen? Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I it was a very challenging but positive challenge to work in that kind of way so i I have a couple of questions for you Mm -hmm. from a practical sense where do you where did they source that social media was it still live that you went and got it or did the producers provide it and it was already captured and Um, for the documentary the director producer and the editors would supply the 
material to us. But was it was it archived and they got permission to use Correct. it? Correct. So it wasn't live on social media still, or was it? Uh, some of the pages were still live um, because I remember um, looking through at some of the, you know, her Facebook and stuff. And chillingly, I think, one of his posts, because how they got led to her killer, um, spoilers, if you want to watch it as well, the murder of Grace Mullane um, on Sky documentaries, and is being released in America as well um, this month. Um, they basically found him through his comments on her like profile page on Facebook. And they're still there. And they're still there. Or I think they've been removed now, but... Um, Probably because the documentary might redirect people there. Yeah, but what was interesting about this documentary was the laws in New Zealand at the time. And I think they're still, they have these laws that um, the identity of the killer was protected under law. But because of what his acts were so heinous, the judge ruled this is an exception. Everyone needs to know his name. So that he lifted the this case so that the journalist could then publish his name. And so that meant that this documentary could then ultimately be made. So I have a question for going back to the sort of filmmaking side of things. Mm-hmm. And if other title designers are are listening to this, so you worked on the the one documentary, twenty twenty. Mm-hmm. Presumably, this other one was what last year or the year before. Yes, yeah, last so year. So about a two three year professional gap. Mm-hmm. How did you find yourself approaching this one with the, those two three years of experience, then compared to how you approached the first one, both maybe from a technical perspective, but also maybe from a how do you make how do you manage manage yourself? documentaries like that? Um, simpler is better, basically. Um, and I think, you know, every project, and this is what I love so much about the job that I do is that every job is different. You know, the team that you work with, the material that you work with, the, um, film, the subject, everything is different. Um, so the approach that we had with, you know, the, the Netflix documentary was very much, um, this is, you know, the Facebook was like her main way of communicating to everybody. Um, so that was the material that we were working with. Um, so we had to create it to look as realistically as Facebook as possible um, without making it Facebook, essentially. Or copyright. Yeah. Um, whereas the Grace Mullane documentary, our approach was you know, through conversations with the director and everything. Um, She mentioned how one of the pieces of evidence was that Grace's phone was never found. And it's like a vital piece of evidence because of all the data that was on it. You know, they were able to access, you know, through data requests, her social media, her location, um, through friends and family, all without that information, finding the actual phone. Without finding That's the phone. That's amazing and scary, but, but amazing. <laughs> but then there's still so much evidence mm-hmm. and questions left unanswered that could be linked to that phone, which they never found. So the way we approached it was, you know, we imagined all the social media that we're seeing on screen is in a void because this phone is in the void somewhere. And we imagined what would it be like if that phone is actually still out there receiving text messages, you know, the messages that people are sending her, you know, friends and family that were concerned about her safety. Mm. Um, They didn't know at the time that she had already passed Um, sending her birthday messages because she disappeared on her birthday Um, and they were texting and calling her and, you know, wishing her happy birthday and, you know, we hope you're, you know, having a great time in New Zealand, you know, you know, wishing you all the best on your travels. Um, so from a creative perspective, we wanted to kind of approach it that way to kind of show that in the graphics that these posts, 
the social media tied to grace is kind of set in a void mm. because it's linked to the phone that is like still yeah. out there somewhere. That's amazing. It really shows the level of thought that goes into design. And it's why I know, like, I feel like people should watch all the title sequences and all of the graphics because every element of film has so much thought mm-hmm. behind it. But it's it's amazing. The, I guess the narrative storytelling behind motion graphics and title design. Yes. That maybe not everyone appreciates. Particularly because so what's interesting is, and this might be an outside perspective that's completely wrong, you guys get to exist in a realm of imagination that, like, like to contrast it with locations, like it might be that the production needs to stay within the M25 or something. So I'm looking for locations mm-hmm. that are geographically limited or if we've multiple locations in one day, then it's again ge- geography in that way. Or whereas I'm imagining your constraints are only money and time. Yes, pretty much. And otherwise it's your imagination could go. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. It's really I see why it's enjoyable. You kind of, you know, think big and then the, you know, constraints of, okay, <laughs> time and budget, <laughs> yeah. you know, let's be realistic. Can you actually pull this off? Um, sometimes you can and it's very stressful, <laughs> <laughs> but then you have an amazing, you know, piece of work at the end of it. At least you hope you do. Um, but then, yeah, a lot of the time it comes down to, and and creatively as well, you know, you might have an idea that you really, really love and you think, you know, like, oh, this would be, you know, perfect. And, the you know, the, the it captures the whole film and everything, but then, you know, the producers hate it mm. or they have something in their kind of mind that they want to see. That sort of brings me on to my next question. So practically speaking, how... How does a title designer get involved in a project, and what is that working process like? Um, so it, it varies. From my experience at Lip Sync, um, quite often, you know, we would get invited to pitch. So it could be for a film or a TV series that has either um, started production, and they're you know starting to think about post production. <clears throat> and title sequences so they invite multiple studi- studios to pitch um and that's like a big part of the work that you do as a title designer is you basically pitch for projects so you get all your best ideas you put together a really strong um pitch deck with um well executed you know style frames or concepts with research to back up your ideas, um, present that to the clients, um, and then wait, <laughs> and then see if maybe you know they liked your ideas or not, um, and and then you could have a bit of conversation back and forth about um, budget and time and you know and everything. Um, so that's that's one area, and then sometimes you're lucky you can get a script. Of maybe like the first episode, um, or a very brief outline of like the synopsis of the film, um, which you know quite often because of security reasons they don't want to share anything, um, so you have very kind of limited information. Um, How do you tackle that as a designer? That you 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 want to design something that's most you know relevant to what they're doing but you only know what they're doing about 20%. I think the other thing too is that because you don't know the music, you don't know the tone. So a lot of the time you just, you can ask and the you know production will send you through maybe like a, a, a lookbook or stuff that they What's work with. So it could be like a um, production will have like a lookbook or like a um, maybe like sketches of costumes, photos of landscapes, locations, yeah. references to other projects. It's like a general, it kind of, kind of like what you get on Pinterest. Like it kind of creates a vibe by mm-hmm. just putting together a bunch of images. We are on Pinterest. Yes, <laughs> anyone wants to find us. <laughs> and it was a discussion point. <laughs> Pinterest is great as a designer. I, I think that's it. really I good advice. Though, um, just ask. 
Yeah. It's weird how that isn't always obvious. Is that camera on? Yes. Okay. Sorry, my eyes. <laughs> it, yeah, it's amazing. That's really good advice, actually. Sometimes just ask. And it's, it's amazing how it isn't obvious mm. to yeah. everyone. I think that's something I went through when I started out in my career is that I tended just to work in a vacuum. And then if, I could, if no one had given me the info, and I was like, well, then mm-hmm. there is no info. And actually, it is such a collaborative industry. And when you're working on a project, it's, you know, the famous phrase of it's an army getting together and, and making it. And actually just asking someone, whether you're on set, whether you're in, a, in the post-production phase, just, oh, so this is what I'm thinking. Would that work? How does this fit in? Yeah. What are you trying to do there? Those just ask questions yeah. creatively yeah. as well as practically. I mean, a lot of the time before we even have like a pitch that we do, we have those initial conversations with the director, producers, the team or whoever we're working with. Um, and we do ask those questions. A good example of the lookbook becoming a really vital part was um, the titles that we did for Winter King. Um on uh, on the based on the books of the same title about King Arthur and the lookbook that they sent us from production you know had like prop designs and things and one of the things that they had was you know the design of the actual sword um that King Arthur uses Excalibur and um, so we incorporated that into our titles which then became really successful and they ended up using those designs in all their marketing so any of the trailers that you see for the winter king you will see the graphics that we you know made for the for the actual show um and they've used those elements throughout the marketing because it ties in so well with the actual show but we did didn't we wouldn't have gotten that without having that lookbook that they sent us as part of the, you know, the initial stages. Yeah, I, I think, I think you're right on the money with the asking the questions in order to capture because it feels like so much of film is realizing visions that you need to be able to understand what is being driven towards, and so for titles mm-hmm. you're designing those graphics to capture it, so it's. Sounds so trite, but a picture is a thousand words. Yeah, yeah. And, and you have to tell a story in such a short amount of yeah, time it's as well. Because some, some title sequences right. are, um, you know, 10 seconds long now. Um, There's so much work goes into this 10 seconds. Yes. Yeah. Even more maybe than yeah. if you'd given, been given a minute. I think one of my favorite examples of storytelling in a title sequence is the title sequence for the video game The Last of Us. Because at the very opening, you you know, it's the very start of this apocalypse. And it's all chaotic and you don't really know what's happening and there's a lot of drama and emotion. And then it cuts to the title sequence. And they use the title sequence as a bridging point to tell the story that they couldn't do in the actual game in that time, which is it's basically a time jump and within the title sequence they communicate what's happening around the world and the virus itself you know with the spores growing and they do that through the visual and audio and that you see that um spores growing and like multiplying and then you get the audio of you know the news reports of you know what's happening and then it gets less and less as obviously people become more and more um, underground by that point. So, uh, and until you'd said that, it's going to make me seem really stupid, I hadn't realised just how powerful a framing device the titles is. Mm-hmm. Because it's the only time, like you couldn't do Star Wars where they do the title, the, the scroll partway through the movie. Like, mm-hmm. like once you start the film, you've, you're committing to being in that world but mm-hmm. as you say like with the last of us they can give you that narrative with through those flashes and it just you're able to bring uh the audience to go this is the type of story we are telling in yeah. this and like in game of thrones like if you didn't have that title sequence and I, i'm 
basically telling a title designer why, why their job's amazing. But <laughs> uh, sorry, my, my excitement, like you, because so much of that, there's so many pieces in Game of Thrones, so many different factions, you've got to try and understand. It's like, I can't think of another way you could convey that geography mm-hmm. in A, so powerfully, and B, in such a short period of time mm-hmm. if they were going to try and do it in anything but the titles. Mm-hmm. Can you guys think of... It feels like it stands alone in how impactful that you, is. You do a, a, a montage, which that, it can be quite boring. So it's much nicer in a title sequence. Yeah. And also, I feel like it is a good um, device. Yeah. You know, you're not only doing the legal contractual part of the job, which is showing people's credits that you legally have to do, but you also tie it in with the storytelling aspect. Um, and it's, a, a, you know, as biased as it sounds, I think it's the best form of storytelling. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I loved what you said, Daniel, about, you know, it's um, kind of capture, like it's its its own kind of, sometimes really successful title sequences are like their own little stories, like standalone stories. Um, and the whole idea of, you know, this goes back to Sol Bass, you know, with Vertigo and, um, or even the title sequence for Seven. You know, it, you, you're committed to this story and the title sequence at the start of a film, um, for example, you know, opens the curtains and takes you into that world yeah. and sits you down and, and tells you this is what you're in for. You know, you go to the cinema to escape so the title sequences for me is kind of like the the doors opening into this world. Um, and then, you know, you've got credits at the end, title sequences at the end of films, which, you know, I feel like, you know, you've just sat through a conversation with this story. At the end of a conversation, you just go, all right, bye. <laughs> and then you leave wait you know? we're not meant to do that yeah <laughs> imagine being in a cinema and then suddenly the lights you know just cuts off lights on all right bye it's yeah. it's not like that and so title sequences and credits for me is a kind of a way of films and stories that you've kind of been invested in investing your time with as a way of saying you know this is the end of the conversation. It allows you to process it. Yeah. It's amazing. And sometimes it allows you, it allows the film to answer questions that have been left unanswered. Um, Can you give an example? Um, Wally was a really good one. The animated so, show. Yeah. yeah. Film. The animated, the Pixar film, Wally. Of course. Um, I'm so stupid. It's <laughs> Wally. I was literally thinking of it as Wally's in like, Wally. where's what? No, like, Wally. where's Wally? Yeah. I was thinking, it was like, the, they'd made a movie of the book, like, where's Wally? And I was like, <laughs> I was like uh, you're not a Wally, though, are you? <laughs> I feel like that would be like a horror film if it was made into one. Where's Wally? <laughs> oh, my God. Um, Disney are like, making yeah. notes. <laughs> the, the, that was a very nice um, kind of example of that where they have all these kind of like murals at the end of the film um, that are sweetly kind of animated that kind of conveys what happens afterwards. Hmm. So, you know, they go back to Earth and then what? You know, they they end the film with them arriving back at Earth. Um, So that sequence kind of just carries through the kind of closing credits of, you know, what's, what's happening you know, yeah. in that world that you, you're just leaving. So on the veins of, of bringing the conversation to the end, mm-hmm. uh, we've taken so much of your time already. I would just like to end with one question and then we'll see if Daniel's got one. I do. We always like to ask our guests if you were looking for a, a, hiring a junior mm-hmm. a designer, someone coming into the industry, what traits do you think make a really good title designer? What would you Ooh. be looking for when you hire? Um, other than a mini me? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'd say the top traits that make a very good title designer is, um, you know, a good eye for design, number one. Um, I find that a lot of motion graphics um, people um, 
you know, that who specialize in motion graphics not necessarily have skills when it comes to typography. And as a title designer, typography tells you so much, you know, the tone of the film, the style of the film, you know, like you can have a dramatic, um, um, serious, um, like historic drama is very different to a superhero kind of TV show set in the future. And that typography says so much. Um, so good typography skills, or at least I for typography, um, and then I for design as well. But then the other skills I would say are just soft skills. So working well with others, taking criticism well when it comes to your work, um, because you know you can have all the you know the amazing ideas, but if it's not what the client wants. Um, you have to be able to change it. And I had a tutor at university that always said, you're a designer, not an artist. So you're designing, basically he explained it as you're, you're creating a product as a designer. So this product has to work well. It has to do its function and it has to be, um, not only does it have to look good, but it has to, you know, function in the yeah. way it's supposed to. It has to be and, understood. Yeah. And also as a designer as well, at the end of the day, it's not really your work. You know, you're being hired by a client to make that work, mm. essentially. So, you know, you if you take criticism well, that's a huge plus because it means that, um, you know, it's very good to be passionate about the work that you do um and take ownership of the work that you do um but then you also have to be able to um let it have its own let, life yeah in a way that you're just like you know you might nurture it and you know it's your baby um but at the end of the day you have to be able to kind of detach yourself a little bit from the work um so i suppose the flip side is the if you're a designer, not an artist, an artist could create for its own sake, but also it could just be their thing. Yes, I think that's, that's really what they the the my tutor was trying to communicate to us as students, as design students. You know, you you can be creative, you can be artists, artists. Mm. You know, but as a designer, you you essentially have to do something that's functional. You know, you can make the most beautiful title sequence ever, but if all your credits are out of title safe or they're they're not in the right order or, you know, they there's like other issues with them, then you're like, Well, we can't use this. And title safe for non designers yeah. means Um so in film, um, depending on the broadcast, um, there is a space i'm probably butchering <laughs> how to like say this there is a area that is viewable on screen at all time and within that space it's called title safe um, and obviously over the years that's kind of changed a little bit because of broadcasts different formats different formats you know we went from standard hd to hd to um 4k to now you know, streaming online where you don't really have title safe, um, but you still get, you know, you still have to basically apply it to everything so that Just you can case. screen it anywhere. Yeah. Um, so those are like considerations that you have to have. So for someone who's listening to this, who just loves film and not necessarily a designer, it's kind of like printing that mm -hmm. you would not put your word right on the edge of the frame because some printers it will could just get cut off. Yeah. Or if you trim it down from a four to a five you suddenly lose a little bit so if you design the whole document with everything in in the a5 the a4 would you know yes would, yeah, yeah yeah that's how i understand it <laughs> <laughs> danny have you got any uh closing question i do it's two i'm afraid uh -huh. um, <laughs> the the first it continues off what tom just said about what are the qualities and traits i'm curious when people have done other jobs and then they come into title design mm. 
what are some of the jobs that you find most common for career switches? Oh. Um, so from my work, I've, you know, worked with various different people in the motion design world who have come from different worlds. And I feel like a lot of it can cross over. Um, so for example, one of the, my course mates, she came from an editing background. She had very little, um, graphic design background, but she had very strong editing. And that was like, you know, she obviously brought that to her, um, her skills. It's its own form of storytelling. Exactly. Editing, so. yeah. yeah. And as a title designer, if you're doing a, you know, a two minute title sequence, you know, editing, you have to self edit or even just graphics that you do in documentaries, you have to time it, you have to edit it. Um, so I think that's a big part. And I definitely had very little editing experience when I first started. Um, so I feel like that was an area of skills that I've developed over time where she came into it already with that, like, you know, under her belt. Um, and then she was learning the, the graphics side of things. Um, you know, she had a much more artistic background from before. So she wasn't like going into the course with like no, you know, experience in the graphic world. Um, but then, you know, I've worked with people who have switched careers and they were um, like an engineer before or doing engineering. And then they, you know, they, they really enjoyed 3D animation and then they got into motion graphics through that way. And do you think with engineering, it's the eye for detail that translates? Yeah. And the technical detail as well, definitely. And there are, there are many engineers who are very have an eye for design like you say mm -hmm. it's just cause some people take different paths you know, there are lots of very creative people in other roles so mm -hmm. that's really interesting so if you're an engineer listening to this yeah <laughs> <laughs> maybe you should be a title designer sure yeah and um, so there was there uh, was a woman that i worked with recently who went into onlining which is finishing so coloring and onlining and she'd basically been doing it for a couple of years but before that her career was an architect and so when I was speaking to her, I said, oh, you probably find that there's a lot of crossover because you have to be very detailed and very um, technical when it comes to online finishing. Um, and she was like, yeah. She was like, absolutely. You know, she finds that a lot of that skill that she had from doing architecture has kind of fed its way into her career now in the onlining world and and the team working and the client management yeah. and all those skills for sure mm -hmm. what was your second question you'd mentioned one website um that's used a lot it was just seeing if there were any other resources mm -hmm. that if you someone was a junior and you were going to say oh you've got to check out these websites it was just seeing if you had anything yeah in absolutely um so the first website that is like the holy grail of title sequences is art of the title um and then we will put it in the show notes yes yeah the description below um so art of the titles is the big one and then you've also got um which i think is a little more underrated is art of the concept board okay um or art of the concept um art um Again, we'll link that below. Um, and that one is um, more to do with, you know, pitches. So work that you do is a pitch that you put like, um, oh, it's art of the style frame is what it's called. Um, and it's concept art that is produced for style frames. Um, so that one's an excellent resource to check out as well. Um and then you've got a couple of other websites, um, like um, forget the film, watch the titles, which <laughs> yeah, lovely, <laughs> which is great. Um, so they've got uh, really interesting interviews, which I would highly recommend. Um, and I think they released a DVD collection of those interviews, 
Um, so definitely check out that website as well and their resource. Um, so those are like the big three that I would throw out there. Brilliant. Th- thank, thank you so much. It's, it's been an absolute delight. Me. Honestly, if producing or podcasting doesn't work out, I feel like I want to be a title designer. <laughs> <laughs> so exciting. Yes, come join us. Yeah. <laughs> and and so you are working as a freelancer. Mm-hmm. So we'll put your contact information in as well if Thank we want to contact you. you or get a title sequence designed for their feature or project. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you, Tom and Daniel. <laughs>